Friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You ever ask yourself the question, what's the meaning of life? Or, or, or maybe you ask yourself the question, what's, what's the purpose of my life? Maybe you ask these kinds of questions when you find yourself doing a monotonous job over and over and over again. Didn't I just vacuum last week? Uh, here I am doing the dishes again today. Uh, I cleaned the same dishes yesterday. I'll clean the same dishes tomorrow. Or maybe you're, you're packing lunches and you say, boy, I do this all the time, day in and day out. Maybe you're in the office filing papers and you're wondering, what's the purpose? What's the meaning of life? Anybody else ever asked that? All right, a few, a few of us. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that we might hit on that a little bit today. You know, uh, the last few weeks we've been going through this, this series that we've called The Way. And, and we started talking about the, the way of the disciple, the way of Jesus that we follow. And it all starts foundationally with what we, what we receive from Jesus as his disciples, and that's, that's core to discipleship, receiving first from Jesus. And, and you can't be a disciple unless you've received that. But the, then as disciples, we connect with other disciples and we, we grow together and follow Jesus together as his disciples. And, and last week we talked about how we witness the, the deeds of Jesus so that others might also be disciples of Jesus too. And, and today we talk about serving, what it means to serve as a disciple, to serve as the body of Christ. And I think this, this has to do with the meaning of life because you and I serve as a witness to the meaning of life. Now, I got to tell you, it would be easy for me as a pastor to, to come up here and preach a sermon and, and, and talk about serving because it's the right thing to do. Or, or that we serve as Christians because we have to obey God. Or that maybe, maybe you once wore a WWJD bracelet, right? What would Jesus do? And it would be easy to preach a sermon and to say, well, of course, Jesus would do the dishes and Jesus would pack the lunches and Jesus would do all these things too because of out of love. And so because he does that, we should too. It would be easy for me to preach a sermon like that. And, and it would be true. Those, those things would all be true. But I think that we can go deeper. And, and I guess if, as long as I'm saying that, I could also say I could preach a bad sermon today too. Maybe I will anyway, right? But, but a, a, a bad sermon on serving would, would say that, you know, we serve because uh, we are just more righteous than the world and, 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 and we are holier than the rest of the world. And so we are holier than thou and we have holier than thou attitudes. Or a bad sermon might say, well, we serve so that we can keep our salvation. If we stop serving, we're no longer going to be saved. Or, or a really bad sermon might say that, well, you, you're not even saved yet, and so you've got to serve so that you earn your salvation. That, that would be a bad sermon. And, and really bad reasons to serve. The wrong reasons to serve. Well, friends, the reason why we serve is that it's the way of the disciple. Disciples serve because of what Jesus comes to do. We serve because of what Jesus is doing in the world. And to really understand what he's doing in the world, you have to go back to the very beginning. When God created the heavens and the earth, and he, he makes mankind, right? He makes uh, men and, and women, and, and he, he creates both of them in his image. And so to be in the image of God meant that they had two big jobs, to be fruitful, multiply, to fill the earth so that there would be humans everywhere, but primarily so that they would share dominion with God, so that they would care for God's creation with God. And, and, and to be in his image meant that they had a right relationship with God and a right relationship with the world. It's one of those churchy words, right? To be righteous. To be righteous is in a right relationship with all of God's world and, and God himself. And so they were in his image and, and they were caring for the world just like God would care for the world. And so that, that's why you have Adam right away naming all the animals so he knows each one and can care for each one. 
Now, you know how this story goes. Uh, of course, Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, and, and all the world is cursed, and there's just a, a whole mess of things, and it, it, it makes a whole lot of messes all over the world where, where now there's sickness, and there's, there's famine, and, and, and war, and animals eating each other, right? It, it's not the way it was supposed to go. The world is cursed. The world needed a new Adam. And so that's where Jesus comes in. Jesus comes in as a new Adam, a a better Adam. In fact, where Adam and Eve had failed to care for the world as they were supposed to, Jesus comes to do the job himself. If you want something done right, you do what? Do it yourself, right? And so Jesus comes as the new Adam to do to do what humanity failed to do, to to accomplish the job for humanity. But but Jesus doesn't just come as God. He comes as God who comes in the form of man. And so he comes as a human being to accomplish the job that human beings are supposed to do, to accomplish the job for humanity. But, But in a way that would be like God would do it, like God being a human doing the job. And that's what Jesus is and what he does. And he does it as God in the flesh. He is the new Adam. And so we we see this in Jesus' ministry then, right? He comes teaching and and preaching and and fixing the curse as as far as the curse is found, right? And he's he's healing people of diseases and, and driving out demons and healing the blind. He is fixing creation's curse, the Adam who cares ultimately for God's creation. And it's, it's Jesus during his ministry that the chief priests and the elders come to. We heard about this a few minutes ago. They, they come challenging his authority. He has this dominion over creation like Adam and Eve are supposed to have that looks like God, and they're wondering where he got this dominion from. Who gave him the right? Who gave you this authority, Jesus? Now, now these chief priests and elders, they ask this question because their, con- their, their conception of authority is different than Jesus' authority. They have a, a sinful idea of authority. And, and I'm sure that we see this all around our world as well. A sinful idea of authority that says that authority is only ever self-serving. That if you are in authority, you are there to serve who? Yourself. An authority that says that others have to serve you. And so instead of a dominion-like authority that cares for God's world the way that God would care for the world, it's a domination kind of authority. Me over you. You stay down there and stay in your place. That's the kind of authority that these chief priests and elders are used to. And it's an authority that comes with prestige. Prestige that says that I am more important than you. You are less valuable than I am. That's the authority they're used to. And so they come to Jesus asking what authority he has. And friends, as you heard a few minutes ago from from Teresa who read Philippians chapter 2, Jesus turns that authority upside down. Look how Jesus uses his authority Let's read this together. It's Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 11. Let's, let's read this together again. It's over the course of two slides, all right? Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Did you see how Jesus uses his authority? He uses his authority to become a servant. He uses his authority to serve. 
And he uses his authority. He could have just stayed in heaven with all the treasures of heaven and, and, and all the, 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 the honor and, and, the, and the praise that comes with that. But no, he, he comes as one of us. He humbles himself to become a human being with us. And, and he humbles himself as a human to accomplish for us what we could not and to give us all the credit. And not only that, but he uses his authority to die. He uses his authority to die all of our deaths. Why can Jesus die your death for you? Because he has the authority to do so. And he uses that same authority not only to die your death for you, but to suffer your hell for you. Why can he do that? Because he has the authority to do so. And it's on that cross where Jesus exhausts sin of all of its power for you. Jesus uses his authority to become a servant. And Paul says that that's why the Father exalts him to the highest seat of authority in the cosmos. Because Jesus wields authority in that way. And so Jesus has the ultimate dominion over all of God's creation stretching out to the furthest expanses of the cosmos. Because Jesus uses a life-giving, a self-giving kind of authority. And so Jesus has authority over the curse. And in fact, he has authority over our eternity, even the eternity of his creation. And so that is to say that I know that you and I are very used to, to dying and going to heaven being, being how, how the Christian life ends. And, and while that's true, that's not the full story. Because we will die and go to heaven, but one day Jesus will will come back here and he will bring us back with him and he will raise all the dead and we will live in a new heavens and new earth. This world made brand new because he's the new Adam who has been given authority and dominion to care for God's creation for eternity. Jesus uses his authority to serve and it's that Jesus that we follow, and, and that's the way of that Jesus. And the way of Jesus for us as disciples is that he's a Jesus who reigns by his death and by his resurrection and by his eventual return. Jesus reigns, and so that's why we follow as disciples, which kind of brings us back to that original question. What is the meaning of life? Well, friends, I think that as Christians, we would say that the meaning of life, of course, has something to do with Jesus, right? And we would say that it is to believe in the reign of Jesus and to live accordingly. To believe in his reign and to live accordingly. Which is to say that we don't serve others as Christians in order to earn favor with God because Jesus has already done it all. And we don't serve others as Christians so that we would be good enough to get to heaven because Jesus has done it all. And, and we don't serve as Christians to demonstrate that we are truly saved because what? Jesus has done it all. Those would be the wrong reasons to serve. You know, when Paul writes this about Jesus in Philippians, that this, this almost like a hymn in verses 6 through 11 about what Jesus does, on, 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 on either side of that, before it and after it, is Paul encouraging Christians to serve. And so central to Christian service is what Jesus does. Christians serve because of what Jesus is doing. And so knowing that that's the context, that that's what comes in the middle, Let, let's look at the before and the after for what Jesus, uh, for what Paul encourages us as Christians to do when we serve. So this is verses three and four, and you can see in the middle, it, 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 it then goes to verses 14 and 15. Let's, let's read this right now together. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then Jesus, and then we go forward. 
do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's what it means to serve. Central to our service is Jesus and what he is doing in the world. And so we serve because of Jesus and we serve like Jesus. We serve because our world is being redeemed by Jesus and that includes you. You are among the redeemed. This world that God created, he's also redeeming for himself, which leads to our second thing, that the way of the disciple is to have the mind of Jesus. So if we serve as the body of Christ, that means we also share in the mind of Christ. So what does Jesus do to serve? Well, he dies to himself, and so we do the same. We die to ourselves so that we might live every day for others. And what does Jesus do? He humbles himself as a servant. And so we do the same. We humble ourselves so that we might be servants of the world. And what does Jesus do? He has a God-like, loving dominion over his creation. And so you and I, sharing in the mind of Christ and being the body of Christ, we share in that dominion over creation to care for it like Jesus would care for it, to care for every nook and cranny of God's creation as if Jesus were doing it himself. That's why we serve. Which means, friends, that caring for God's creation in the big ways and the small ways, the fun ways and the really not fun ways, the smelly ways, and you get the idea, it's all holy. The poopy diapers and the messy politics and the pollution You want to know what holy work is? What holy service is? It's getting involved in things like that. Big and small. Because it's God's world. And as far as the curse is found, you and I share with Jesus in service to the world to to bring the remedy of the gospel wherever we see the curse which maybe gets us back to that original question. The meaning of life? What's, what's our purpose in the world? I think that if you're going to answer that question, of course it has to start with talking about the reign of Jesus, a reign that looks like service, who uses his authority to serve and to care for the world. And so we might hear at Trinity describe the, the meaning of life as first receiving, receiving from Jesus' cross and from his empty tomb what only he can give. And what's the meaning of life? Well, it's to connect with other redeemed people and to grow as the, the, the people of God and the body of Christ. And what's the meaning of life? Well, it's to witness the deeds of our king to the world so that others might receive in Jesus and connect with disciples. And then we might also say, what's the meaning of life? Well, it's to serve his creation as co-heirs with Christ. In fact, you you maybe heard that phrase in the the baptism where Hudson was called a co-heir with Christ. That's true for him, and it's true for for all of us. We've been made co-heirs with Jesus of all the treasures of heaven. And as co-heirs, it also means that we, we are people who also receive the image of Jesus. We have dominion over the world like Jesus would have dominion over the world. In baptism, Hudson received again the image of God, but now the image of Christ. And you and I have the same, the image of Christ that we bear towards our world. And that comes with authority, but not self-serving authority, but world-loving authority. See, Jesus redeems and restores his creation. It's the same world that in the beginning he called good, right? 
and it's still good, and he redeems it, which means it's God's world twice over. He created it, and he redeemed it. So whatever we do in this world to take care of it is holy, because this world is holy, because it belongs to God. You know, there's this quote that I really love. Um, it's, it's attributed to Martin Luther, but, but we're, we're almost certain that he did not say this, but I guess he gets the credit for it anyway, because we don't know who else said it. Uh, but this, this, this quote goes like this. Even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. What's the purpose of life? I think it's to remember that this is God's world and Jesus is reigning and this world is holy and that caring for this world and cultivating this world is a holy work but that Jesus has also redeemed this world to last into eternity. And so the things that we do in this world are also redeemed for eternity. And friends, that's, that's why we care for our home and our family. It's, it's why we care for our community, and it's why we as a church care as well. It's, it's why here at Trinity, we, we do this thing called a clinic in the toy store, which if you have never done that, do it. It's, it's a fun day, and you go home saying, wow, that was really cool to be part of. It, it's why we as Trinity do things like food drives or diaper collections. It's why we support a maternity home. Or why our youth go on mission trips. It's why here at Trinity, why we're looking at at ways that we can reach out to the Hispanic community. It's, It's why here at Trinity we have a school so that we're raising up the next generation to take care of God's world. It's why week in and week out you have volunteers who help to make this worship service happen. Every week. Because the truth is, is that we are called in the way of Jesus, in the way of Jesus is to serve, to make sure that his world is provided for, and to make sure that his word is proclaimed. So friends, I'll ask you, what's your apple tree? In what ways has God already called you to serve? In what ways are you already serving? Then maybe ask yourself the question, Where is God calling you to serve next? In Jesus' name, amen.